Okay, hello and welcome to this lecture on the problem solving sessions for ML. We will be discussing a few practice questions for each of the topics we have studied all this while. Okay, this will help you to strengthen your concepts that you have learned. As always, a brief about me. My name is Aditya Grawal and um, I am a recent graduate, postgraduate in computer science and engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. I worked in hybrid based technologies as a data scientist and that's where I got introduced into the world of ML. And uh, today we will be solving some few questions. I'll start with the first question. And these questions are based on two topics today, which are the first two topics we learned. One will be the introduction to data science, machine learning, and the second part will be on the K nearest neighbors algorithm. So let's begin. Uh, this is the first question. The first question says that how would you handle missing or corrupted data in a data set? So there are a few options given like you would drop the missing rows or columns you would replace the missing values with the mean median or mode you will assign a unique category to the missing values or you will do all of the above okay so what are the ways by which you can handle missing or corrupted data in a data set so the correct answer to this question is option d you can do any of the above but there are some scenarios where one will not favor over the other. For example, look at option A. So option A says you will drop those missing rows and columns. For example, let's take a, so the option A says you will drop the missing row or column. Okay. Now, the thing is, um, if you have a very large data set, right? Large data set in the sense, so if you have a large data set, okay, let's say it's a, there are 1 million rows, okay, and it consists of two classes, and I'm, uh, it consists of two classes, so Y belongs to either 0 or 1. So positive or a negative class and the data is balanced. Okay. So it's 50, 50, okay. 50% 50 are zero, 50% have class one. Okay. There's no imbalanced data set. It's a perfectly balanced data set of 1 million rows. Let's say you did some, uh, uh, analysis of the data and you see, and let's say there is, there is only two features F1 and F2. There are two features. Okay. And upon your data analysis, you found that F2 has no missing value, which means for each row in my data set, F2 is populated. For each row, there is a value present for F2. But for F1, there is missing values okay. okay and you dig deep a bit more and you found that there are 50 rows with missing values okay now on a data set with one M rows, right? There is no problem if I delete 50 rows, okay? Rather than me making a guess on some row, on some value, what I will do is I will just remove those 50 rows. I'll just drop those 50 rows. Now, it could also, you might think that what I will do here is, let us say that F1 is a feature which has about, uh, 100k rows with missing value and you might think that this feature has not much value in it because there are significant number of rows with missing values for example in this case 10% of the rows 
you might think that I can drop the F1 feature column. Now, if you understand, right, you had only two features and you are now planning to remove one of the feature only because 100K rows do not have a value in them. The other 900K do have. So in this scenario, since you have a less feature set, then dropping the feature F1 might cause some issue. Again, why might, I will explain. It might cause some issue. And that is why it's not always advisable to remove features or remove columns. Remove columns is same as removing features if you have a data set with less number of feature set. So, and another example of how you would remove columns or features would be even after you having, um, even if even after you having a very good, uh, you know, um, uh, feature with all the values populated, you might still drop it. So what do I mean by it? Let's take a simple example. So all of you have uh, heard about, I guess, the house pricing data set, right? Everyone has heard of it. So there are two features. So one is the number of bedrooms, hall, kitchen. Then it's a two BHK flat or a three BHK flat. And there's nothing, something called square feet. Okay. And this is my Y, which is the price. Okay. The price of the house. Let's say I'm just populating with some data two, one, one, three, four, two. Okay. Number of square feet for this will be, let's say a thousand. This will be, um, 1,100. Let's say this will be 900. This will be, um, let's say 1,400. This will be 1,800, let's say. And this one is again 1,100. Okay. The num square feet, number of square feet of the house. Okay. Now let's say for this one, it is one CR. Um, let's say for this one, it is um, 70 lakhs. Okay. Or maybe let's say for this one, since it's a bigger house. Okay. I mean, square foot wise, it's bigger, even though it has one bedroom, that's okay. It is, let's say, um, 1.1 1 .1 CR. This is, let's say, 90 lakhs. And uh, let's say this is 1.4 CR. Let's say this is 1.8 CR. And this is 1.1 CR as well. Now, if you see very carefully, right, if you, there's a reason why I have written the data set like this. There is a direct relation between square feet and Y. Okay. You mean see 1000 square feet, 1 CR. 1000 square feet, 1.1 1 .1 CR. 900 square feet, 90 lakhs. 1400 square feet, 1.4 CR. So by looking at this data only, you will be able to build your linear regression model. Right. It won't be very, very difficult. Correct. It will be Y equal to some, let's say this is X1. This is X2 to so some bias term plus some value times X2 plus some value times X1. And then you can find out. So now you can see that X2 has a very good indicator, right? By just using X2, I'm able to estimate the value of my price very easily. And in this scenario, when X1 is not that uh, relating to the my target variable, which is Y, in that case, even if you remove, let's say X1, it won't do any much uh, too much harm. Okay, by looking at this data set. So that is how also you can remove this data missing column. And this thing is also called correlation analysis. So you are trying to find the correlation between each individual feature with the target variable and whichever has the highest amount of correlation, you will, um, you will, uh, you will, uh, you know, you will skip it. And the one which has very less, you will uh, remove it. Okay, so this was the option A. I hope you understood this. So option A is not very favorable if you have a lesser number of rows or if you have a lesser number of columns. Option B says you will replace the missing values with mean, median, and mode. So mean, median, or mode, as you know, are three types of central tendency where you can given a set of data set data data values. You might find out that whichever which which column has what is the average value of a column what is the median or what is the mode again i've explained in this in the, my lectures as well if a data set has outliers 
then maybe using the mean is not the best measurement because mean is very susceptible or very affected by outliers. In that case, you will use a median. And mode again, if there are multiple values, there are, if there's a column with only unique values, then maybe mode is also not the best measurement in this scenario. But median actually works for almost all the scenarios and median is what I would prefer to use always in my projects as well. Option C is assign a unique category to missing values. Again, you can do this. You can maybe, if you don't want the model to suffer, if you don't want a model to say, oh, this is blank, right? You can just assign a unique category that if this value is missing, then that means it's a, it belongs to some other missing category, let's say, okay? That way you can design it a category, then you can do one hot encoding, label encoding. I've not talked about all this, but again, so it's more like, um, you'll assign a different category to this variable and analyze that category on its own. Okay. So that would be the three options. And typically one would employ any of these three options. That's why the correct answer is option D. So moving on to the next question. Um, when performing regression or classification, which of the following is the correct way to pre-process the data? So before you always do regression or classification, you would do something called data gathering, which is if you have a relational database, you will fire up an SQL query, get in the corresponding data, put it in pandas, or maybe you can directly download it from a source, the CSV file given in an S3 bucket, let's say. There are many ways you can get the data from, right? There are different data sources. You can get the data, then you pre-process the data. So during pre-process, you can do something called normalization of data. You can do something called principal component analysis. So if again, if you remember PCA, we typically employ doing when we want to, you know, um, reduce the dimensionality of our data. So if you have a huge dimensional data set and you want to reduce it to some small number of dimensions, then you would do PCA. And, uh, and one thing about PCA is you're trying to project data onto a line, right? You're trying to find the principal components and you're trying to project the data onto a line. And um, that is why uh, it's always, always advised if you are in this scenario, if you're trying to project, if you're trying to find, uh -huh. so if you're trying to find, use the variance. So if you remember PCA uses some method by tries to maximize the variance of your data set. For example, if you have something like um, this, Let's give a very small example of a data set. Okay. Let's say you have a, okay, maybe, maybe I'll draw try again. Yeah. So maybe there is a uh, data set like this. And you might think that, um, so Aditya, what I can do is, um, maybe I'll do something like this. So I will take this as my principal component, the X axis, right? And uh, project all my points on this axis, okay? And that way that will be one of the ways I can reduce the dimension from a two dimensional set to a single dimensional data, right? But if you think of this way, you can see that more many of the points will overlap in this scenario and you won't be able to get to know about the spread of the data, which is the variance. So what PCA tries to do, it, PCA tries to preserve the variance of the data so that that will give some insight into the prediction part. So that is why what we do is we typically find principal components, which are lines where I can project the individual points onto this line. And that will be my principal component analysis. So whenever we are dealing with variance of a data set and anytime we are also doing dealing with the distance formula or anything as such, okay then it is always advised to normalize the data first, then do PCA, and then after that you do the training. Okay, so you normalize the data, do PCA, and then you do the training. And that is why the option C is your, option A, sorry, is your correct answer. There is no point of normalizing the PCA output. Once you get the value of the PCA, or once you get the principal components, they will also be normalized by default. Okay. Cool. So the next question is, um, what is the difference between a validation set and a test set? So if you have saw my lectures, I have given a very good example in that scenario about what is the difference between a validation set and a test set. So I hope this won't be very difficult to answer. 
the correct answer to this question is option a right so option a will be the validation set is used to evaluate the per height okay wait a second ah sorry so option b will be the right answer in this case why because i'll explain why each option is incorrect option b is a validation set is used to evaluate the performance of a model during training while a test set is used to evaluate its performance after the training correct and uh, so typically what do you mean what do i mean by this is um, so it's more like um, so if you are preparing for the gate exam right let's say you are preparing for the gate exam and uh, your training set consists of these lectures okay which means you are trying to build a model you are trying to learn something learn the concepts of the gate exam so your training set will be some lecture videos okay and your testing set is the gate exam okay and when you actually give the gate exam you only use the model which is you have watched the lecture videos and uh, you have learned the concept and then you apply it in the gate exam okay there is no point of improving that time okay whatever you have done you have done the gate exam is your d day we call it the d day right d day means it's the day where you have to perform so how can you guarantee that the lecture videos that you are watching is actually helping you to crack the exam right and that is where the concept of a validation set comes in what the validation set will do is what you would do in the scenario is you will solve some practice questions or you will solve some previous year question right pyqs or previous year questions that will help you to understand that whatever lecture videos that i am watching that i am learning whether that will help me to perform good in the gate exam or not right so a validation set is used to evaluate the performance of the model during the training process while a test set is used to evaluate its performance after you have trained the model once you are in the testing set you are not supposed to uh, modify or refine your model it should not be that you are giving the gate exam you see that oh i will look at this answer of this question you see the option is a and then you will go and refine you can't do that in the exam right but what you can do is you can solve the previous year questions get a hold of what is the correct answer improve your model based on the feedback you get from the solving the question so that is why a validation set is used again option a is incorrect here because validation set is not just used to tune the hyperparameters there are models there are some models which do not have any hyperparameters you can still use a validation set for example validation set is used when you are trying to train a model with number of iterations n your testing error usually goes training error goes like this which it always reduces the training error while your validation error will first in decrease and then increase at this point you know that you are uh, after this point you are overfitting the model so you would stop your model training at this point right so that is the best way you can say that and validation set and test set are the same thing again no they are not the same thing you can use a validation set to fine tune your model but not a test set a validation set is not necessary that is also somewhat correct okay i mean this is the, now it is so much required validation set it's more like if i tell you let's say you are watching only the lecture videos can't you crack the great exam can't you get rank 1 maybe you can get maybe you can get okay maybe you are thinking that oh okay i will train and train and train i will my training error goes here lord forbid the test error uh, validation error i don't care about it and then you are believing that in the test in the test uh, time in during the exam time gate exam time i will crack the exam right that is also not the right approach to these questions so validation set is also necessary to in machine learning but it's not mandatory it's not that you need to do it okay fine okay so the next question that we have here is um, choosing of oh, this we come on to k nearest neighbors and the question is choosing dash values for k can be noisy and will have a higher influence on the result option a is do you select a smaller k value d is do you select a standard k value c is do you use your large k value or d is all of the above which values of k that you can choose that will make your model a bit more noisy 
and have a higher influence on the result okay i hope you guys are pausing the video and thinking some time and then on then looking at the solution because then only you will learn just try to apply your concept and then you will be able to answer it better so correct answer to this question is smaller why is smaller okay um it's a very very basic thing okay and why so first of all let's say if you have an uh, simple data set okay and uh, let's say it consists of two classes process and circles okay and these are my green circles just a basic data set okay let's say my value of k is 1 value of k is 1 meaning i will only look at the nearest neighbor the first nearest neighbor to the data point let's say the data point is this maybe i'll just make it such that you guys understand the point let's say it's this okay and i ask you what how how would knn classify this point will it be green or red your model if it looks at the nearest point it looks at this green point and say it's green but if you look at the data does it look green because if you see this data if you if i would have taken more number of predictions let's say i would have taken the four nearest neighbors then maybe i would have easily answered red because three of them are very close only one is the green part maybe that green data is noise for some reason it falls on this part of the uh, falls on the red area right so that is why that's called noisy okay now let's say i will increase the value of k to 3 you would see this one this one and this one and the point could be classified now as red so the smaller the value of k more will be on noisy okay and will have a higher influence on your result okay there is nothing called standard k value by the way in knn depends on your data set okay so that should not be confused by that word in itself okay okay so this will be the last question for this video i plan to cover five questions in each video okay forgot to mention that sorry about that so this is the last question of this video and uh, this will help you to learn a new concept as well very important okay not from uh, even not from a gate perspective you can think of it if you are looking for a job in the ml field as well so feature scaling is helpful in knn algorithm do you think true or false right the answer to this question is true why so so before that if i ask you a very basic question okay let's say very basic okay let's say you have a test data point x test the data set has two features one is the number of bedrooms it has again we go back to the same example we showed a bit earlier let's say it is 1 comma the square feet of it let's say it's 1100 okay this is my x test and let's say you are trying to find out the distance from a point let's say xp which is given as 1900 now if you calculate the distance of the point xp and x test you are currently the only person in this conference yeah i think for some reason i got disconnected i don't know how but x test and xp there are two points and let's say the distance we will calculate you will say it's 1 minus let's say you are using euclidean distance plus 900 minus 1100 whole square right now if you calculate the distance you will always see that this term will be huge compared to the first term, right the second feature x2 will be huge as compared to the first feature x1 correct so always whatever distance you find x1 will have very less impact on it because you are always considering because the range of values for x1 is much lesser than the range of values for x2 so that is why what you can do is you can do something called feature 
scaling, which is you're trying to change the range of the individual features. Again, how does it work? There are two ways to do feature scaling. One is called normalization. In other words, it is also called as min-max scaling. Okay, so normalization would mean that if you have a feature X, the value of the feature X will be X prime, let's call it, is whatever is the original value X minus whatever is the minimum value of the feature, which is X min divided by what is the maximum value minus what is the minimum value. And I can guarantee that X prime will always lie between zero and one. Again, how so? Let's say if the value of X is X min, okay? I see x the minimum value of x I'm calling it as x min then the value of x prime will be zero if you put plug it the plug the value of x equal to x min and if the value of x is x max then numerator and denominator become the same and that's why x prime will be one this way what you are doing is now each of your values of your data set are lying in a range from zero to one rather than it being like very the difference being huge and the other method is called standardization Standardization ensures that that whatever transformation you do to the data set, whatever you do the feature scaling. Okay, so what I'm saying is x prime is x minus mu over sigma, where your mu is the mean and sigma is your standard deviation of your data set. Standardization, what it does is it, it doesn't ensure that the individual values are um, have the value between zero and one. It ensures that the mean, final mean of the data set will be zero and the standard deviation will be one. Again, whichever, which is better, which is not, that's not the point, depends on the data set. But these are the two ways you, you can do it. Some people also call normalization as min max scaling. Okay, it's, it comes from the formula itself, but don't be confused with that. Normalization means the same thing as the min max scaling. Okay, so feature scaling, if you can do here in this KNN algorithm, if you can convert the features, you can do normalization. What typically people do is they do normalization, they use some method to find the optimal value of K, and then the optimal value of K they use and train the model, they get some score. Then they do standardization, do the same thing. And then they try to uh, find that uh, whichever score is better, that will be the final uh, conclusion to this data set. Okay, so this is all I wanted to talk about in this lecture. I hope your concepts are a bit more strengthened after looking at this lecture. In the next lecture, we will talk about the next two topics that we start here, which is, I guess, naive base and logistic regression, if I recall correctly. And um, after that, we'll also look at the other two topics and two topics and two topics. These are small, short, half an hour videos for you to better grasp the concepts of machine learning. Okay. And if I can give you one few. Okay. So what I will do in this case is I will also give you a few tips as well. So make sure if I ask you a question, like I think I'd covered it in the class as well, that um, in KNN, if the value of, should the value of K be odd? What is the advantage of it being odd? Does it make any sense if I make it even? See, it will work absolutely okay if it is even, but in the even scenario, it could be that two, let's say that by binary classification problem, if it is select the value of K as four, let's say, then two points might belong to one class and the other two belongs to the other class. And that can cause an issue in which there can be a tie. So to break ties, we typically use an odd number, right? So um, uh, there could be other questions like convergence. You can see the convergence proof that I've showed in the cl uh, class. Lectures are uploaded on YouTube for you, and that would be very, very helpful for you to understand more about these concepts. Again, other lectures will be coming after this lecture in the near future. If this is helping you guys to learn more and solidify your concepts and boost your confidence, then make sure you subscribe to this channel and like and share this video with your friends with your peers who are trying to also prepare for the exam and um, we'll see you in the next lecture thank you for joining goodbye